In an age where people may pick their preferred pronouns, we still struggle with the cultural perspective of those who question their gender role. Gender dysphoria, tonight on Call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. I'm Dr. Deborah Johnston, your Prairie Doc this evening. There was a time when one could be jailed for not conforming to societal gender expectations. Now we are working to find a way to deal compassionately with those issues. But first, a look at this week's Prairie Doc quiz question. It's a true or false question tonight. Gender identity is defined by the external genitalia at birth. True or false? Viewers who call in the correct answer will be entered into a drawing to win a copy of the book, The Picture of Health. Each of Dr. Holmes' essays, originally written for On Call with the Prairie Doc, comes with a wonderful accompanying photograph by Dr. Judith Peterson. We will announce the answer and the winner at the end of the show. Remember, you only have 10 minutes to get your answer in. We answer your questions about gender incongruence as they are called in or sent to us via Facebook or email. Call in questions to 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email to the address on the screen. Joining us tonight in the studio is Dr. Ann Dillon Schneider with New Ideas Counseling. And remotely via Zoom is Dr. Keith Hansen of Sanford Fertility and Reproductive Medicine. Welcome. It's mm -hmm. just great to have you guys here, and I'm really excited about this topic that we have on, on yeah. deck for tonight. Yeah. And can I start with you? Can you tell our audience a little bit about your background and how you came to be involved with transgender care? Well, I actually first started working with um, transgender people in 1992. Um, I was a pastor of a rural church and someone walked in um, looking very male and said, I think I'm female. Well, that started a whole exploration and over the years, more people found me. Um, and in 1994, actually, I had the, uh, in a church where someone uh, was transitioning, it was the NICU nurses who said, do you know that five and a half million people, are, when they're born, we can't tell if they're girls or boys. I said, you've got to be kidding. So that also started me off on many adventures. Um, but in the process then went on to get a degree in clinical psych, a lot of work in gender and in trauma. And then when uh, I ended up doing my residency up in Fargo in ADHD and what was then Asperger's, now high functioning autism, which turns out to also often um, accompany diagnoses that transgender people may have. And so little did I know that all these things of trauma and gender and autism would be a toolbox that then would become more and more helpful um, for people uh, who are transgender. So I moved to South Dakota, uh, licensed as a counselor for complicated reasons, um, and then had an opportunity to earn a gender specialty. Um, so I was one of the first people in the world to earn that, and then now I'm a mentor for um, people coming up in mental health, on the mental health side, uh, to work with people who have gender incongruence. So uh, when I started out, that's not what I knew, but I would be doing, but it all happened because somebody just walked in my office back in 1992. Fabulous. It's amazing yeah. the, the paths we take to get where we are sometimes. I think it's called just say yes and learn from other people. So I learned so much from my patients. <laughs> Fabulous. Yeah. And, and Dr. Hansen, tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. I um, am what's called a reproductive endocrinologist and infertility doctor. And I guess I got interested in reproductive endocrinology when I, when I was doing my residency in the Navy. I had the, the um, opportunity to do a fellowship in reproductive endocrinology at the National Institutes of Health, where we got to see individuals that had many of these disorders, the disorders of sexual development, what used to be known as hermaphroditism. And so we would take care of these individuals and um, determine how to best manage them and allow them to progress on to puberty. And also at this time, of course, we studied steroid, you know, all the different hormones and how they affect the body and how they affect fertility. 
Um, subsequent to the Navy, I then went down to the Medical College of Georgia, where we once again studied in depth um, disorders of sexual development and um, gender um, dysphoria and the treatments for that. And then finally, a few years ago, moved up to the um, to um, Sioux Falls and joined initially joined University Physicians and then transferred over to Sanford Health, where I um, work as a um, reproductive endocrinologist, basically taking care of hormones and, and the such. All right. Uh, so you both have a very wide ranging practice <laughs> in, in your areas, so that's fabulous. Mm -hmm. You know, I, th I think that for most of us here in South Dakota, our understanding of um, the trans world is pretty pretty limited and pretty basic and it's certainly changing really quickly so maybe we could get some definitions of some terms so that people have a little bit um, of a baseline understanding of what we're going to be talking about tonight and can I can I have you weigh in on that so um, we often confuse sex sexuality or sexual orientation and gender um, sex is your body it's when somebody looks at you at birth and goes, it's a girl or a boy. Unless you <laughs> or wanna, who knows? <laughs> or who knows, because this happens. Um, sexual orientation or sexual attraction, is who, it's who we're attracted to. And then gender is actually uh, who we know ourselves to be inside, which actually is very much affected by um, DNA. Um, it's by brain structures, hormone signaling. A lot of this happens in utero. Um, and our, our body sex, and I know Dr. Hansen knows this, um, our body sex is actually uh, determined in a hormone wash in the first trimester when we're developing, uh, still you know, before we're born, and the brain gender is actually set in the second trimester. And so you can imagine if the timing is off or the hormones are off, the DNA signaling is off, and there's, we've got 50 years of research on this, so we actually know that being transgender is much more um, internal and, and, so to speak, invisible. It's not as obvious as someone when they're born, we can't tell if they're male or female. It's internal. And so after a lot of research, um, actually 195 countries have now determined it's a medical condition and it will be coded next year in the ICD-11 as a medical condition. And then the mental health side is more related to stigma and discrimination. So, so we've got some people who on the outside know that there's a difference, but many people, millions, several million in the United States for whom this is an internal difference where the gender that they know they are and that their DNA is signaling, their hormones are signaling, is not matching up with the body and its development. Okay. And so Dr. Hansen, can you ex explain to us a little bit about um, how is my gender identification different from my sexuality? Well, um, just to back up just a little bit, I think one thing that a lot of people don't realize is, is that when we are first, you know, when we're back as an embryo inside our mother's womb, mm -hmm. you know, you can't tell the difference between a male and a female yeah. embryo at that stage. We're at that stage of development, we both have um, bo all the genital structures to form either a male fetus ultimately or a female fetus ultimately. And it makes sense that a lot of the other organs, like the brain and such, under the influences of multiple different things, can um, have the same plasticity or the same um, sort of changes that can occur. And sometimes they are not always congruent. You know, they don't always, you know, everything isn't the exact same that it's supposed to be or not supposed to be what it was designed to be mm -hmm. from genetics and gon gonadal sex. Um, our, you know, basically our, our gender identity is what the person feels, you know, mm -hmm. inside themselves as to whether they're a boy or girl. Um, and then who, and then the, their sexual attraction is who they're attracted to as an individual, if they're mm -hmm. attracted to, you know, um, females or if they're attracted to males um, or to both or to neither. I think that that's something that, um, most of us in, in our generation mm -hmm. are just really learning is that 
what we grew up expecting and understanding that mm -hmm. there's men, there's women, mm -hmm. you're attracted to men or you're attracted mm -hmm. to women. And in my generation, we were starting to see the gay rights. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were starting to have an increasing awareness that, hey, there's a lot of people that are attracted to people of the same sex. Um, mm -hmm. So it became a little more understandable that you might be gay and maybe you might be uh, bisexual. That was pretty radical when I was growing yeah. up. Um, and now we're starting to understand that there's even more to it than that, mm -hmm. that there are people whose brains are telling them that their, their body isn't matching up with what they feel, what they know to be true about themselves, um, and that gender is not a one or the other, it is a spectrum yeah. of so. experience and how I identify. And sexual attraction, romantic attraction, is also a spectrum of how I identify. And I think that that's something that a lot of us are kind of struggling to wrap our brains around because it's not something that is familiar to us and anything unfamiliar is difficult. Yeah. Although learn. I will say I've got um, a couple of uh, patients who are from ranching families. And uh, they see gender and sexuality diversity um, among animals. Yes. So it's like, oh, wait a minute. I've seen this before. Yeah. Maybe there's something similar. So, yeah. so I think people who are more connected with, um, who are living more rural, actually more uh, connected with animals and have seen more difference than sometimes those of us who are a little more isolated from some of those natural processes and natural outcomes. Yep, and I think that that's very true too, that most of what we understand comes through our own cultural experience yeah. and cultural expectation mm -hmm. that maybe doesn't match up as closely as we think mm -hmm. it does with the way the world actually mm -hmm. is. I think it was about two years ago, I think, Dr. Hansen, I think it was where the AMA finally came out and said that gender is actually not a binary, that it's a, it is a spectrum. Um, and it's, I think, um, I, I wish that I had known earlier from my friends who worked in NICU for, for the, the yeah. neonatal intensive care units that this happens all the time, that children aren't, you can't always tell, we have to wait to see who the child is. Um, and it's the same thing we do with transgender children, we wait to see who the child is. But I wish the AMA had come out sooner because they, they've known this for decades and decades, mm -hmm. of course. But also wish that some of the medical professionals in like, for instance, the churches where I worked, thank goodness those women spoke up and said, and everybody went, oh, we didn't know this, please teach us. Yeah. Um, but it normalized I, some things for us. And I think that that is a very good um, perspective. I don't know this, please teach me. I think that's mm -hmm. a good lesson for all of us to yeah. keep in mind. We have some questions, so let's, <laughs> let's get to our questions. Mm -hmm. um, the first question is, my grandson says he is bisexual. Is this the same as gender dysphoria? Dr. Hansen, I'm going to mm -hmm. throw that one to you. Um, thanks. The, um, no, that's not really the same yeah. as um, gender dysphoria. That's more the, um, the person's sexual attraction, if they're attracted to, or they're actually attracted to both males and women, to males and females, um, as opposed to um, gender dysphoria. Uh, and here's a related question that I'm gonna th throw to you, Anne. Uh, does everyone who is transgender experience gender dysphoria? Actually, the answer is no. And I wanna piggyback on, uh, on uh, Keith's um, response too, is that sometimes people who are trans um, thinks that, think that it is an issue of sexual orientation. So we actually have diagnostic criteria um, that we have to go through. And actually, um, we all have 120 pages of, of standards of care we have to follow as well. So it's very carefully, um, the work we do is very carefully and very finely tuned and insurance companies follow the same thing. So there's quite a bit of accountability around the work that we do. Um, your question, not everybody experiences dysphoria. There are people who will never have any body changes or hormone changes at all. They're okay with their body. They just, um, they know that they identify differently and they just live their life in a way that's comfortable for them. And that's why in the ICD-11, the new coding that's coming out next year, the diagnosis is moving from gender dysphoria to, a, and dysphoria just means a discomfort between who I know I am and my body. Um, it's going to be gender incongruence because it's just there's a mismatch 
but not necessarily dysphoria. So the criteria that we'll be working with in 2022 are changing a little bit um, with that, but it's still a medical condition. Then. And I think that that's a great thing because we really want to recognize an individual experience and not a blanket, try to shove exactly. all the pegs into the same square hole where they don't really fit. Right. So um, that's a, an important thing for us to recognize. Here's a, a question that I think is, is probably a basic one that I should have uh, gotten <laughs> earlier, but doc, Dr. Hanson, Keith, what does cisgender mean? Well, cisgender is like when the gender um, identity correlates with the sex, sexuality or the sexual identity. So like if, if you're born with female genitalia and then your gender identity is that of a female, then you're a cisgender for, um, or a cis female in that case. If you have male genitalia and a male um, body and you have the, you know, your male and your gender identity is male, then you're cis. Trans is when you have, um, you know, gender incongruity, where if you have uh, male genitalia, but you're a female, then you're a trans female and, and such. So I, I think, you know, in, in Greek or Latin, I can never remember mm -hmm. which was which, but cis means same, same, same. side. Right. Trans means across, right. opposite sides. So right. uh, we use that a lot in, in medicine, mm -hmm. um, about when we're identifying body parts or placement of things, cis and trans. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's an important thing to keep straight. Her gender assigned at birth was male and her name was Kenneth. But Kendra Heathscott knew early on that her gender assignment was incongruent with who she really was. And somewhere along the way, uh, I started, you know, identifying more with female things as a young child and, um, you know, I started identifying with being trans and, you know, I started identifying with, you know, Barbies and toy, girl toys and like girl singers and like girl people and, you know, I, my mom was curious about it, you know, they initially thought I was going to be gay and I was like, okay, so, you know, I don't think I'm gay either, like I think I want to be a girl and date like boys and they're like, okay, alright, makes sense. So we moved into, you know, the area, we talked to a therapist, my mom and I talked with a therapist and she said basically, um, your child has gender dysphoria. At the time it was called gender identity disorder. Now in the DSM-5 it's called gender dysphoria. And um, being diagnosed with that is basically just um, an out of placement with my body. Um, I feel gender dysphoria when I see parts of my body or when people tell me about parts of my body that may be masculine or the opposite of the gender I'm trying to portray or feel inside. Um, so it gives me great displacement when I experience gender dysphoria. Um, so for the therapist to tell me what something was and give it a name for the first time really changed a lot for me and I was able to really just start on the journey of finding out like about myself, about my health, um, inside and out. Um, because gender dysphoria is a health issue. I would say that being transgender is not a one-fits-all journey. Everybody has a different journey when you're transgender. You know, some people decide to take hormones. Some people decide to not take hormones. Some people decide to get the surgery. Some people decide to not get the surgery. Um, it really is just a case-by-case -case basis for each person's journey, and most importantly, their treatment plan. I know it can be very easy for folks to think trans people, you know, they just wake up one day and they decide this, and we don't. I mean, it's, it's not something we just decide. It's something that is like kind of bestowed upon us. We definitely don't choose this. I mean, I definitely would not choose this. I, I wish I could. I wish I could. I wish I could choose this. Um, but, to, but what I can choose, and when people say, oh, well, maybe it's, you know, when people say it's a choice, what I can choose is to be as good of a person as possible. And I don't think that has to do with being transgender. I think that just has to do with being a good person. And my dream is just for peace and just for people to, that sounds so beauty queen, but it's true. I, I, I really just want to see peace. And I know it's possible for this country and I know it's possible for all of us to meet halfway. I, I know it is. Um, 
and I and I know how difficult you know it is to wrap your head around someone like me when you've never been around someone like me. But trust me, spend a few weekends with me, or go out and shopping, get some coffee, you know, binge watch the Golden Girls, whatever works, whatever's good. You know, I think I think that you'll realize that we're actually a lot more normal and human than anything. But in the end, I don't want just tolerance. I prefer respect and I deserve respect, you know? And every trans person deserves respect, whether you want to understand them or not. Love one another, be braver and braver every day, and wear a mask. Kendra, if you're watching, thank you for the wear a mask. Your whole, I appreciate hearing from you and that was, was perfect, so thank you. Um, in her interview, one of the things Kendra talked about was the importance of not just loving one another and being kind, but of listening to those who may not fit the gender mold that you expect. I think that's a really, really good uh, perspective and, and point for us all to make. Do you guys have any thoughts or comments on that? I think it ties in a lot with, I love, I love what Kendra said, and Kendra, we do have masks here and we are six feet apart. Yes. <laughs> um, and so, uh, but the idea of respect, that really respecting each other, um, which is, is so important, and again, helps us learn. One of the biggest things um, is to, when a person tells us their name, is to use that name and to use the pronouns they choose. Um, you know, I, I was talking with some students, journalism students earlier, and uh, we were speaking about, you know, if your, your roommate has a nickname they wanna use, you call them by that nickname as a matter of respect. Well, it's the same thing if someone has a name that may not match what you thought, but it is their preferred name, is to use that name to use those pronouns because actually it's, to not do that is called misgendering and that is the biggest trigger for suicide. And this group of um, our fellow companions in South Dakota and across the world has about a 40 to 60% suicide attempt rate. And so the, the kindest, best thing we can do is be respectful, use the names people ask us to use no matter who they are, and listen, learn their story because it's going to enlarge our world. Yes, I think that's a very good point. Um, Dr. Hansen, here, this is kind of a related question here. What is the definition of dysphoria? Well, it's basically where the individual, you know, is, um, oh, has dis, um, oh shoot, has, you know, distress related to some in, something that's going on, like in gender dysphoria, the individual has distress because of their, you know, their sexual, their body doesn't really match with what they feel that they are. Um, you know, I, I think it is a very, would be very difficult to be, like if I thought I was female, it'd be very difficult to be stuck in the body that I'm in right now. And I think vice versa. So I can, you know, it's where they have a distress over some issue in gender dysphoria, it's due to distress over their current gender. All right, so mm -hmm. I think what you were saying, Anne, about suicide attempt mm -hmm. rates um, is a real statement of distress yeah. with that, and um, we shouldn't make people more distressed than mm -hmm. they are, especially when it's something so simple as to call them by the right name. Exactly, so. and it's and just to contrast that the national suicide attempt average is about 4.6. So when you start talking 40 to 60 percent, um, our teenagers are about 60 percent. Um, that is really concerning, obviously, and that's why um, you know the work that we do and the care that the whole community can give to a transgender person and their family um, is really important. Yes, absolutely. Um, here's a question. I've heard that the Native American culture approaches gender identity in a unique way. Can you discuss the two-spirit tradition? Is that so some... I'll, well, I'll say, I'll say this about this, what I learned from um, a wonderful um, uh, Omaha colleague from USD um, who explained to me that um, two-spirit within at least some traditions is actually a spiritual condition 
um, somewhat distinct from being transgender. And so um, I'll give you contact information for her to let her talk about that because that's really her culture mm -hmm. and, and for her to really speak to that because it's, it's, um, it's not just a um, A equals B. It's, it's, a, it's more complex in terms of the roles and the culture. So yeah, I, yeah. As, from a cultural competency point of view, I need to pass on yeah. that one. Well, I, I think that that's yeah. a, a, it brings up a larger issue though, which is that um, we t we're talking about transgender, we're talking about male mm -hmm. and female, and we're talking about trans men mm -hmm. and trans women as if this is another binary situation, right. and it's, it's not. not. <laughs> um, there, there is a whole continuum and whole range of sexual identity and sexuality in between there, uh, and we're using some shorthand that maybe isn't fair for us to learn, to use. And we're also approaching this whole topic from very much a middle American perspective, right. and our perspective is not the only perspective out there. Many different cultures have many different um, understandings of how mm -hmm. gender and sexuality work, and uh, that's a, a good question to bring that in, that there's a lot of nuance mm -hmm. in the world Very that we're, we're really missing uh, for the, in the interests of simplifying this yeah. topic. So. There are, um, not to, you know, there actually are some cultures where um, your gender is actually fluid. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the Dominican Republic, there are actually tribes where children will be born as um, females, but then due to a genetic ab abnormality in their hormones, at, when they go through puberty, they will actually become males and they are totally accepted in their society mm -hmm. as initially when they're young as girls and then as they go through puberty males mm -hmm. and they're um, at that stage of life they can actually um, have children and um, so there are examples like you were saying not only of just um, you know like two-spirit individuals but also of individuals where they mm -hmm. can change their um, gender throughout life due to hormonal things due to hormonal changes and genetic things. Yeah. Just another example of the amazing complexity of life. And uh, that's yes. great. Uh, here's a viewer who has a question about GMOs and if they might have a role in gender dysphoria or if it has ever been considered. And I'll, I'll assume that when they're saying gender dysphoria, they really mean gender incongruence. Right. Well, I know that in utero and, and, and Keith, um, I know you probably know more about this than I do. I know that some of the things that can affect, um, you know, the developing child, um, you know, has to, it can be hormones, it can be stress, it can be toxins, it can be smoking, asthma. There's a whole number of things that can affect what all the signaling that's going on because the way that DNA spools up has to do with those influences, as well as just the uterine environment can also affect. So I'm not sure we have the last word on it. On the other hand, we've had gender diverse, transgender people since the beginning of time. So it's not like it's a new thing. Um, so, but I don't know about the GM, whether GMOs connect on that or not. Keith, any, are you aware of any research on that or any ideas not on that? Not on specifics, but we do know there are um, certain conditions where the fetus is exposed that mm -hmm. places the individual at higher risk. Mm -hmm. um, of gender dysphoria um, or even sometimes other issues. And some of those are like, one example is congenital adrenal hyperplasia yeah. where the little fetus mm -hmm. is making huge, amount, huge amounts of androgens. Okay. And um, you know, it, in, when the baby girl is born, she looks a lot like a baby boy. And you know, you would, and in some of those individuals have a higher incidence of gender incongruity, but um, not all of them. And so it's really complex. It involves, you know, the DNA of the individual, the, um, the hormones that are made, the stage of development where those hormones are made, and the placenta. Mm -hmm. I mean, the placenta is an amazing organ. It can really mm -hmm. take really high doses, like individuals that have very high testosterone levels, um, the 
placenta can actually convert a lot of those into estrogens and make it so it won't have much of an effect on the, on the embryo or the developing fetus. But in other individuals, it doesn't work that well. So yeah, that's a, an incredibly complex problem and issue, and we're just starting to understand it, but there are probably numerous things that can have an impact yeah. upon the developing embryo, fetus, and ultimately the baby. On both the body and the brain, and yes. the whole point of this is the body not matching the brain. Yeah. So, um, there's a comment from a viewer, and I want to thank this individual for for calling in with this. Uh, that in our promotional materials, we mentioned the term gender reassignment and that that term is incredibly outdated and you mm -hmm. are absolutely right. And <laughs> so thank you for drawing that to our attention uh, and we will get that corrected. So yeah. uh, Keith, what is the preferred current term that is the respectful term? Well, it's, you know, affirmation of mm -hmm. the, you know, correct gender. Right. And, you know, it's quite a complex process um, that these individuals go through. Um, and it depends a lot on a number of factors. First of all, probably the most important part is being evaluated by um, psychology. And Dr. Dylan Schneider does a wonderful job of working these individuals up, making sure that they actually meet the diagnostic criteria, that they don't have any underlying um, psychological issues that need to be treated or psychiatric problems. And then, you know, when they come to us, we do a, a thorough history, physical examination, trying to make sure that there's not some other underlying genetic, um, hormonal, or other issue that might be in, um, might be a, a playing an important role, or that if there's some complication or potential issue that could cause a complication from taking the cis affirm, you know, the affirming hormones. And so they do, before we give them the appropriate hormones, they go through an incredible amount of evaluation mm -hmm. um, prior to beginning that. And then they continue that whole process throughout the time of the hormonal um, changes prior to even approaching the ideas of surgery. And then at that point undergo um, the affirming surgeries after they've been on hormones for a while and still met with their counselors and went through all that. All the work is really collaborative and it's designed that way. Um, so I, like Keith was saying, I, you know, I do my part. Um, the endocrinology team does their part and we're building circles of care because of course, first of all, I'm, I'm always concerned about the person's um, immediate loved ones because that's mm -hmm. the best circle of care and, and family support is actually the number one life sustaining um, uh, power in a person's life. And that's what keeps especially in our, our young adults and our teenagers and children alive um, while they're going through this because obviously it's very confusing. So there's a child and then that circle of family support that we really want to be strong. And then, then my job is to help start building the team because you're gonna have a medical team go with you for most, basically the rest of your life. And so that's me, that's endocrinology, it's different kinds of surgeons. Um, it can be elect people who do electrolysis, um, all kinds of things that we end up getting into, but we start building teams. And then there's, you know, of course, then there's friends, there's people at work, you know, I even work with HR departments because we want the work environment to be supporting. And South Dakota employers have been amazing and understanding. Um, in working with both tr um, transgender employees and their colleagues at work. Um, but we build circles of care, but it's all collaborative. And so nothing is done simply um, with anyone who's a minor. The parents are involved. They're in the room the entire time I'm working. Um, so they know everything that's going on. So we, it's constantly collaborative and it is designed that way. And our standards of care require us to be that collaborative so that we are constantly in communication. Um, I know at one point I did, um, uh, in talking with a surgeon, we actually had to delay surgery on somebody because we were concerned about their mental health. Mm -hmm. And so it was a team decision with that person. Um, and I think that that's it's something really important for people to know that. It's very important to point out that this is not a knee jerk, just make a decision on Saturday and everything's done on Monday. This is a very meticulous, um, detailed process. So, Zaylor Stout. The author of the book, Our Gay History in 50 States, was in Brookings last fall, speaking at SDSU. 
on-call co-producer Ginger Thompson sat down with him to learn about how the book may educate American society as a whole. I was on one of my many road trips from California back to Minnesota and this was around the marriage equality debate time so you know um, it was still in the courts in California because it was legal it was illegal it was legal again um, Minnesota had been the first state to defeat a marriage amendment and it was just a very turbulent time from a marriage equality time and so each time I crossed over a different state line I would ask myself well what relevance does this state have to LGBT history what relevance does this state have to LGBT history uh, when I got to Wyoming I of course I thought about Matthew Shepard and um, I wanted to lay flowers at the, the fence that he was chained up to and left for dead and it wasn't information that was readily available and I thought how is this not possible I was like there should be a road trip guide for LGBT folks fast forward a bunch of years I ended up speaking at a national coming out day luncheon um, and Judy Shepard Matthew Shepard's mother ended up being one of the keynote speakers there as well and it was like the 19th anniversary of Matthew's passing and it dawned on me that this family is living through the worst day of their life every single day for 19 years for me and my community and I thought that I needed to do more so within two weeks I was meeting with the publisher within two months I started writing the book and two years later the book was out in October 2019 one of the first ideas for the book was, you know, if somebody were to come out, like this could be like a gift to them. Um, especially since, you know, LGBT folks aren't normally raised in queer homes. And so it's like, where do you learn about your history then? I would think it would be an amazing welcome gift for somebody from that perspective. But then as well, um, you know, now there's, there's five states that actually uh, require the teaching of LGBT history in schools. And um, Illinois is one of those states. And so they've actually approved for the use of my book for their LGBT curriculum there. But the other states are New Jersey, Colorado, uh, California, as well as Oregon. One of the first challenges I knew that I was going to have to get over is how do you make it so that all the history isn't in a California, New York, Florida kind of situation, right? And so what I did was, is um, the book, the, each state is broken down into people, places, and queer facts. And so I was like, well, how do I spread out all of these people? And so I ended up crediting everybody's contributions back to the state that they were born in. And so that ended up being the great equalizer, because when you think of an Ellen DeGeneres, you don't know, you wouldn't necessarily think of Louisiana though that's where she's from, and so her contributions get credited back to her home state. And so doing it that way, um, it's, it really spread the wealth in regards to um, the LGBT history from this across the country. Um, but as well, I mean, each state really did have their own flavor as it relates to history. There's certain states, there's still more challenges, right? Because there aren't as many protections as there are in other states. Um, but there's still history and significant folks nonetheless from each and every one of them. You know, LGBT history is, is is, is difficult to find because, you know, people haven't been able to be out for a, an extended period of time. There's a huge chunk of our country's history where if you were out, you could be, you know, hospitalized, you could be arrested, you know, lose your job and your family, even though that's still the case for some folks now. Um, but I ended up enlisting an army of queer youth to help me do the research. So that was great because it was like this, you know, part, partially a community effort where they got to learn about their own history. They got to help pick the state that they wanted to. Some of them did their home state, some of them did other states. Uh, but it was great to be able to have, uh, you know, that collective effort in regards to coming up with the, the facts necessary for the book. I think one of the things that Zaylor said that really struck me is that the great equalizer is where people are born. Mm -hmm. So that means that there's a lot of people in South Dakota, people that are transgender, mm -hmm. people that are genderqueer. They're not just in New York and California. They are mm -hmm. our neighbors, they are our friends, and that's important for us to remember. It brings a, another question up, though. Uh, what is the percentage of, they say babies born, but it, obviously gender, gender incongruence is something that doesn't show up until somebody is older and able to express and have a gender preference. Uh, Keith, do you know what the percentage of individuals that are um, gender queer or gender non-conforming? I'm, I'm not exactly sure. I don't know what the most recent numbers are, but um, you know, it's not very, it's not real common, but um, you know, it is, we definitely have individuals in the, you know, in the state who are gender non-conforming. Um, I went back and last year counted, and I think we're, we saw like 29 individuals 
who were transgender below the age of um, 18 okay. over that period of a year last year. Yeah. Do you have more numbers, Anne? I had done some uh, looking up for a presentation I did. It's, it's about, it's a little under 2% of the U.S. population is intersex, so that's where the, the outer body obviously isn't matching. And if you, that's where that five and a half million comes from. So in South Dakota, if you look, base it on roughly our current population, it's about 15,000 people in our state. That's a, that's lot, a lot of people. people. And then in terms of um, gender incongruence, it's somewhere between about 0.6% and possibly into like 1.5, somewhere in there. But even on the lower end, that means we've got about at least 5,000 people. So That's this is like 20,000 of our neighbors. We're not that large a state. So yeah. the likelihood of you knowing someone who has, and that's just the obvious things, not even some of the things that Keith has talked about with um, some of these more complex, subtle yeah. hormonal differences. So the likelihood of any of us knowing someone who is a little different but may not have told us is very high, actually. Um, this is a good question that kind of plays into that. You had mentioned, Keith, that you had, had 29 children under the age of 18 in the last year. How do you work with those kids and how does it relate to hormones or surgery or those kinds of things? And do you make an effort to change the gender on the birth certificate? Um, Keith, could I have you address the medical side of that? What, what do you do for those kids? Do you just send them off to the surgeon so they can have body parts reassigned? <laughs> no, no. Um, no, actually the um, the way that we manage those children, once again, is in very close consultation with the uh, mental health experts and with Dr. Dylan Schneider. <clears throat> and, you know, they're during the entire process, they're being evaluated yeah. and um, and um, and just, you know, and having receiving counseling. And I think it's important to realize that you know, at the beginning, there's a huge, no well, not a huge number, there's a much larger number of kids that mm -hmm. have questions, and that by the time they actually get to the point where they receive treatment, it's been reduced down um, quite significantly. Um, and the way that we like to do it is, once again, when we see a, a child that's referred in for a gender incongruity, we do a, a good history, physical examination, laboratory data, and basically follow along with them, discussing any concerns, making sure that they have psychological consultation, because as Dr. Dylan Schneider said, these individuals are at very high risk of suicide or self-harm. Mm -hmm. And then as they continue to grow, once they reach um, stage two of pubertal development, which means that they're starting to, to develop hormonally, then um, once again, they're reevaluated and make sure that they still meet all the criteria for gender incongruity. That's where we do um, a pubertal blocker. So in other words, we start on medications that shut everything down and give them more time, yeah. more time to be for, further evaluated, more time to sort out, you know, questions in their mind. And we, um, during that time, we watch them for other potential complications from the pubertal blocker. Um, and the most common one that's used is a drug called lupulide acetate. And we usually continue that pubertal blocker till they reach the age of 16. And once again, as long as they still meet all the criteria for gender incongruity, that's when we start talking about, and I'm um, backing up one second, pubertal blockers are completely reversible. Yeah. There's they will, once you stop them, puberty will resume. They'll go into, no, they'll be able to be um, sexually um, mature. They'll be able to have children. Um, and so they're completely reversible. And then once they get to the age of 16, as in most individuals, um, they're then at that point, we consider starting them on the affirming hormones, which are partially reversible. There are parts of the hormones that are reversible mm -hmm and parts of them that are not. And then we continue that till they reach majority in the, the country where they're at, which in South Dakota and this area is 18. And then they can start thinking about um, permanent changes like surgery and all that, and um, like top surgery 
or bottom surgery or other types of um, gender affirming surgery to help them. But once again, probably I think one of the really important parts of this is um, Dr. Dylan Schneider's watching them very, very closely, making sure they confirm the diagnosis um, and, and such, and watching them for any evidence of hurting themselves or, or suicidal ideations. And, and I, you know, I it's think quite that amazing when you I, watch these kids under treatment, yeah. they, they go from hurting themselves to becoming just, you know, amazing little kids. They come out of their shell. They're starting to, you know, paint. I have some children that are amazing artists and they're, they're dancing. They're doing all sorts of wild, amazing um, things once they, they really are like a, a flower opening once they get on the appropriate therapy with the appropriate counseling. And I think that that's something that's so important to recognize is that you're not doing anything to these kids that is irreversible. You are giving them time to sort out their real feelings, to, to make those big decisions and not letting something else irreversible happen in the meantime. So I think that's really important for people to recognize that puberty blockers don't do anything permanent, just they just keep something else permanent from happening and give these individuals a chance to, to live the life that they'd like to live and make that decision before they... It really does lower the distress. I mean, we've got, had some transgender boys who were ending up in inpatient unit every month when they had a period. You can imagine being a little boy having a period is absolutely terrible and of course terrifying the parents is these kids are trying to commit suicide because they're so distressed. Um, and, and that's important too is um, these parents are always involved with all of us. They're in the appointments. They're in the appointments with Dr. Hansen. So we're constantly, nothing happens without parental approval and full knowledge. Um, we couldn't anyway, it's illegal, but yep. we wouldn't because of the, the, the most important thing is that the kids have such a good um, support, support community. And then, you know, all the way along, as, as Dr. Hansen said, I'm doing differential diagnosis. A lot of these kids have high functioning autism, which means that, you know, that's going to affect their social transition because you've got medical transition, legal transition, which um, can be done. It's, it's very doable, requires all the appropriate channels have to follow and parental permission again. And then we also have social transition, which is much more confusing because, you know, if you're raised as a girl, you don't know really anything about being a boy. And if you're a boy, you really don't know about being a girl. And there's so much social coding that has to happen um, along the way. So that, and that's actually the more complicated part. Everyone thinks about medical and yeah. legal. And where I actually do is an awful lot of accompanying both family and the person and their loved ones on that social change journey. And I think that that's another very important thing to give people time to mm -hmm. make that social transition and to know that you know, some transgender individuals never do more than a social okay. transition. They don't want hormones or surgery. Yep. So that's an important thing to know. And now for the answer to tonight's Prairie Doc quiz question. Gender identity is defined by the external genitalia at birth, true or false? And the answer is false. The winner of tonight's quiz is Charlotte Verhe from Rapid City. Thank you, Charlotte, for participating, and a book will be in the mail soon. We'll be right back after this. Extra, extra, read the Prairie Doc Perspectives weekly column in your local newspaper. More than 130 newspapers in the region print the newspaper column written by the Prairie Docs, covering a variety of medical and health-related topics. Ask your local paper if they print Prairie Doc Perspectives. America is grappling with a difficult legacy. Our society was built by the blood and sweat of slaves on land previously occupied by Native Americans. When we won independence, only white male property owners were fully enfranchised. Enslaved peoples were not even fully counted under the Constitution. Married women had no legal identity. Immigrants, particularly from Ireland, Southern Europe, and Asia, faced open hostility. Catholic churches were vandalized. Nearly a thousand Jewish refugees fleeing Nazi Germany were turned away in Miami Harbor. Japanese Americans were forced from their homes and into internment camps. 
We have a proud heritage of noble ideals, but we have often failed to live up to them. We have emphasized our differences not to celebrate the rich tapestry of life they create, but to divide ourselves into us and them. In the last 250 years, our society has moved in meaningful ways towards equal participation. Slavery is illegal. Women can own property. People of different races can marry. We still face the consequences of generations of discrimination. But most of us find that we have opportunities our grandparents did not. The LGBTQ plus community is the most recent to demand an end to discrimination. Awareness is increasing, but many people still have little information or have misinformation about the diversity of human sexuality and sexual identity. Three years ago, a close high school friend shocked me when she revealed that she was, in fact, a trans woman. I wonder how many other people I've met and cherished have felt compelled to hide something so important. We know that suicide attempts in the LGBTQ community are higher than in the general population, particularly for young people who are bullied in their communities or rejected at home. LGBTQ individuals are more likely to be victimized by violent crimes. I often think of the saying, a rising tide lifts all boats. It reminds me that working to improve my neighbor's well-being makes my own more secure. This is especially true for the neighbors who don't look like me, who don't pray like me, who don't vote like me, who don't love like me. If their rights are threatened, it is only a matter of time before mine are as well. We can all look back in our family trees and find someone who faced discrimination for their race, religion, or class. And of course, we all have mothers and grandmothers. Let's remember those struggles and extend compassion. We are more alike than we are different. A big thank you to our guests, Anne and Keith, for volunteering their time to help us learn more about gender incongruence. If you would like additional information about this program or to see and hear more episodes, please like and follow us on Facebook and YouTube or visit us at prairiedoc.org. And be sure to look for the podcast of this program, Prairie Doc on Call, wherever you get your podcasts. And that does it for tonight from all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people. In antiquity, physicians believed that the liver was where love resided. Now we know how really important it is for our health. Hepatitis, cirrhosis, and the health of your liver. Next time, On Call with the Prairie Doc. We all want people to have the ability to make appropriate decisions about their health care. To do so, they need access to information from reliable sources, like our Prairie Docs and their guests. Hello, I'm Stephanie Herseth Sandlin, and I serve on the Volunteer Board of Directors for the Healing Words Foundation, a 501c3 organization established by Rick and Joni Holt. The Foundation accepts gifts from those of you who wish to support Dr. Holmes' legacy and continue this mission, which is so very important to rural residents and communities across South Dakota and in neighboring states. Please consider a personal and corporate gift. Go to prairiedoc.org to make a donation today. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by 
Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call with the Prairie Doc as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions, Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians, Avera Heart Hospital, First Bank and Trust, South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Vance Thompson Vision, Monument Health, Black Hills Medical Society, Brookings Madison Flandreau District Medical Society, Peer District Medical Society, Sioux Falls District Medical Society, Yankton District Medical Society, Aberdeen District Medical Society, Urology Specialists, Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, Lake Ponset Sailing Academy, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, Dakota Bank, South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. <laughs>